This morning I want us to turn to Matthew chapter 5 where we've been considering what is perhaps the greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher to ever live. And I want us to begin by reading together verses 1 through 16 because I want us to notice the context and then I want us to notice a not so subtle change that takes place as he goes through this. See if you can pick it up. Well, I'll help you pick it up. It says, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain and he, after he sat down, which was the custom of a rabbi, he would sit down and when he sat down, his disciples knew that was when you needed to sit at his feet. And his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and we've seen that. And blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then he says this, Blessed are you. If you're going to live like this, you're going to receive this blessing. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Notice the change in pronouns. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And remember Jesus, when he, right before the crucifixion, he went to Jerusalem and he was praying over Jerusalem and weeping for it. And he said, you who kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to you. This is no popularity contest if you're going to live the Christian life the way it was meant to be lived. And then he says, you are the salt of the earth. Incredible statement. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now, eight to ten times, Jesus refers to they or them and there in the first ten verses. But then in verses 11 and following, He gets intensely more personal and He switches to the pronoun you and your. Because when a person commits to living a godly life as spelled out in the Beatitudes, persecution from the world is inevitable and When you and I are attacked for our faith, it becomes intensely personal, doesn't it? Up until that time, you can kind of live a nondescript life and nobody knows or is upset about anything about you, but then you share with somebody at the water cooler or you share with somebody in the neighborhood and all of a sudden, you know, you've got a big X where your house is. You're a marked person. You know, godly influence... Kind of cuts both ways. I, wonder, I just want to read your passage in 2 Corinthians 2, beginning in verse 14. He says, But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. We're going to win. We've already won. The battle, the war is over. The battle's simply being a mop up operation. He says, And manifest through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Him in every place. That sounds like influence to me. It sounds like, you ever seen a, been in a house where they're cooking something really good? Doesn't matter what room you go in, you can smell it, right? The influence of that pot roast or whatever it is that's being cooked just kind of permeates the whole house. That's a Christian. Or that's meant to be a Christian in the influence we have. He says, for we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, an aroma from death to death. When you really live the Christian life, it puts people on edge. Some of them. They may respond to you in a very hostile manner. They may even kill you. 
as we're seeing in other countries. But it says to the other, an aroma from life to life. You know, we have eternal life, and that eternal life should permeate every relationship we have and cause them to either see us as an aroma of death or as an aroma of life. Then he says, and who is adequate for these things? You know, when you think it through, it's like, who is adequate for these things? Why should I give my life? Why should I spend my life for Christ? Why should I be willing to even go to possible martyrdom for Christ. We're going to talk about this morning. Jesus warned us about this, didn't He? We just read in John 15-18 in the high priestly prayer of Christ, He said, If the world hates you, know that it hated Me before it hated you. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, Because of this, the world hates you. We give off a distinct aroma in a world that is dark and sinful and wretched, and it's either an aroma of life or it becomes an aroma of death. It condemns or it saves. And it may cost us our life. Jesus again promised in John 16.33, said that in the world... We will have tribulation. He didn't say we might have, but he said we will have. But he said, but take courage. I've overcome the world. How did he overcome? Well, he overcame through the cross and the grave. Because he rose, we'll rise also. Death is just the beginning of life, not the end. Whether you give your life soon or later, you're going to give it. Paul even told us in 2 Timothy 3.12, he said that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That's been the testimony down through the ages and the experience of God's people throughout the centuries as Pastor Craig so ably told us about two weeks ago. It just happens. You desire to live a beatitude quality life in Christ, and I can guarantee you, you will suffer some major persecution. America is a grand experiment. It was founded on great principles, biblical principles, and Persecution hasn't really gotten gone full blown here, but there is that possibility. How are you going to respond? Are you going to want to still have that salty influence? Are you going to still have that light? Are you going to let your light shine, or are you going to tuck it under the bushel? And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. And I, I think the question we need to ask ourselves and answer from verses thirteen through sixteen this morning is. Why should I be willing to suffer persecution for my faith in Christ? Why is it so important that I keep the faith and not deny my allegiance to Christ even in the face of persecution, even in the face of possible death and martyrdom? What's at stake here? Why is this such a big deal? Why not just live a lie and be at peace with the world? Coexist. I mean, you've probably seen that sticker, right? Why not just be a Christian that coexists with everything. You know, because all pathways lead to heaven, right? (laughs) That's what we're being told today by the heretics and false prophets. Why is it so imperative that we stand firm on the Word of God, that we stand firm on the Gospel, that there is no other way to heaven than through Christ? Well, in verses 13-16, through Jesus tells us why it's such a big deal. It has everything to do with influence in the world. The first reason is in verse 13. You and I as followers of Christ are the salt of the earth. The second reason in verse 14, you and I who belong to Christ are the light of the world. And verse 16 tells us thirdly that we are to let our light shine before men in such a way that they may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. We're to live to the glory of God. We are the only hope this world has of seeing the light of Christ. The light of the Gospel. The good news in the bad news world. We're it. There is no other way to God. I think we need to take that responsibility and that joy of knowing that. That we have found the answer you know, I was thinking of the Relay for Life. Great event. I'm excited. They, they raised so much money for, to fight cancer. But you know what? Somebody's going to die of something even if they beat cancer. <laughs> you know, we're all going to die of something. 
But Christ conquered sin and death, and the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Romans 6.23 tells us, we've got the cure, the ultimate cure for everything. Because everything out there is going after us, right? Doesn't matter if it's politics, the world, the uh, food that we eat now. It's just, you know, everything's just kind of polluted, right? It's just the way this world is, but we have the answer. We have the cure to it all. Now, this passage presupposes several things in a spiritual sense. First of all, that the world is rift with the decay and corruption of sin and depravity. Man is lost in his sin and depravity. There's not the good guys, the good sinners, and the bad sinners, and the good sinners will make it, and the bad sinners won't. You know, Hitler isn't the only guy that's going to hell. Everybody without Christ is going there. That's the condition of our world. That men, by their very nature and actions, are depraved and evil. And though man has advanced scientifically, and, and medically, and historically, and educationally, and psychologically, and technologically, To an amazing degree, I'll grant that he is still morally bankrupt and corrupt. Look at our society. Look at our world. Man, a lot of things are great, and you know, it's great that we can do medical operations and all kinds of stuff, all kinds of weird technology. You know, pretty soon you'll be driving your car to the store, you know, from sitting in your living room or something. You know, I've been reading about that stuff, and. You know, it's just amazing what man has accomplished, but it hasn't helped his moral, spiritual condition. That's the real problem. And as one author said, instead of improving the moral and spiritual quality of his life, man's discoveries and accomplishments have simply provided for ways for him to express and promote his depravity faster and more destructively. Think of modern weaponry. You know, at least he used to have to be kind of an athlete and beat people up with a sword or a club or something. You know, now you can sit a mile and a half away and pick them off with a fifty caliber. Or you can just blow them up. You know, I mean, those are the things we... Look at the internet. Great thing, but there's millions and millions of porn sites on the internet. You can get any filthy thing you want on it. We've improved in that regard exponentially. But the problem is, man is sinful in his very nature and being. And there's no pill or operation or electronic device that can fix that. Only Jesus Christ. Only the indwelling Spirit as man repents of his sin. Secondly, and I hope we believe that. You know, I read a survey one time that you know, of preachers that actually preach the Word only was like five, 51% actually preach the Word. And only, five out of, only one out of six in the congregation actually believe what they say. And it's kind of... But that was a Barna survey. And I, I, don't, I don't go over that too well. But it, uh, you know, we need to actually believe these things if we're to be salt and light. Secondly, these verses presuppose that the world is shrouded in the darkness of sin, desperately in need of the light of God's truth. You know, Paul put it this way again in 2 Corinthians. I love the way he puts this. In chapter 4, beginning in verse 3, he says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Why is it veiled to those who are perishing? Well, in whose case the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. You know, a blind person is in the darkness, aren't they? I mean, they can probably see light through something, but they're basically blind. They're in the darkness. Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Why? So that they might not see the light of the Gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Oh, what a statement. He says, For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus is Lord, and ourselves is your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. That's light. That's what it means to shine the light. You know, I love that. You know, if we could sum up Paul's words with what Jesus said in our passage for today, 
you and I are the light of the world. We literally reflect the light and glory of God by the way we live and the message we bring. You know, I love that. We, because God is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. You and I can reflect the light of the glory of Christ to a watching world by the way we live and by what we proclaim. So, let's look at it. The world's in sin. The world's in darkness. We're salt. We're light. Let's look at what it means to be salt and light. First of all, you and I as followers of Christ are salt are the salt of the earth. Notice what he says. Verse 13, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless... Does salt ever become tasteless? Think about it. Can you, can you take away the property of salt? Can you so dilute it? I mean, we even dilute it with a gigantic ocean that, that covers 75% of the earth's surface, and it still tastes like salt, doesn't it? Think about that while we go through this. He says, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Note to begin with, Jesus says, this is who we are. It's an emphatic statement. It's put in an emphatic position. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. I believe that meaning if there's anyone in this world that is salt, And if there's anyone who is light in this world, it's us as Christians. Nobody else is going to be doing it. Nobody else is going to be salt and influence for Christ. Nobody else is going to shine the light of the Gospel unless it's us. That's what he's saying. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. The question is, are we salty? The question is, are we letting our light shine? It's who we are and it's what we are, but are we letting our influence influence those around us? Are we letting our light shine to those around us? That's that's the question we need to pose. Now, salt in that ancient world was a very important commodity. The ancient Greeks called it theon, meaning divine. That's how much they liked salt. We're trying to get rid of it. You know, I, I, I don't know if you notice on the menus even now they're listing how many sodium milligrams are in it and so on and so forth. And some soups you can get ten times your quota for the day just in one can of soup. But anyway, in those days it was thought of to be divine. The Romans held that except for the sun, nothing was more valuable than salt. Often Roman soldiers were paid in salt bringing about the saying that he's not worth his salt. He wasn't worth being paid. In ancient society, uh, sharing a meal and salt was a sign of friendship. God even made a covenant of salt with David in 2 Chronicles 13.5 and the daily sacrifices in Israel were were to be offered with salt in Leviticus 2.13 because it was so valuable. It was thought to be so valuable. So salt was valuable, and to say we are the salt of the earth would have been understood in that ancient world as meaning we are a very valuable commodity and influence in this world, even a divine influence. So it means to be the salt of the earth. And commentators came up with all kinds of possibilities as I was reading this. And and one was that they say salt is white, standing for purity. You know, we talk about though your sins be as scarlet, they will be as white as snow, or they'll be as white as lamb's wool, and so on and so forth. Blessed are the pure in heart. Talks about white robes all over the Bible, but especially in the book of Revelation, because we are washed in the blood of the Lamb. We're purified in the blood of the Lamb. And and they talk about the influences of a pure godly life. That's a salty life. Others emphasize the characteristic of flavor. You know, because salt's very flavorful. If you've ever oversalted something, you realize how strong that flavor is. They say that a godly life adds flavor and life to an otherwise tasteless, dead and sinful world. That the believer brings the life of Christ into a world dead in its trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2.1 says. Still others view salt as a stinging force of agitation because 
when you put salt in a wound, it stings as it preserves and heals. And again, 2 Corinthians 2, we saw that it brings about the aroma of life to life and uh, to those who are being saved, and the aroma of death to death, those who are perishing, salt cuts both ways. It, it stings and exposes sin and, and exposes the depravity of man, and at the same time, it heals. The gospel will either condemn you or heal you, right? Based on if you believe. Still others see salt as creating thirst. They say you and I, by the way we live, create spiritual thirst in others as they see Christ in us, the hope of glory. Our saltiness is what creates a thirst for Christ in others. And all these views have validity, but I think the main purpose in that ancient world for salt was preservation. To keep meat from spoiling and rotting, basically. They'd rub rub, you know, like salt pork and all that kind of stuff. They'd rub it down with salt and it would have a preservative lasting effect on, on, on the meat. And in the same way, we as Christians are the preserving influence in this world, aren't we? Our wicked world desperately needs our persevering influence. Think about what this world would be like without the true church. Don't think about it too long. It will be depressing. Very depressing. John 16.8 tells us that one of the Holy Spirit's works in and through our lives is to convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. And what keeps this world from falling into total darkness and evil is the presence of the Holy Spirit working in and through us as the church. You know, as the church becomes more and more marginalized, look at what's happening to our society. As spiritual things become less and less the measure of things, look at what is being promoted and even legalized. You'll get some idea what how influential and salty the church is in our society because, folks, without the church, this society is going to be left to itself and it will be ugly. It's getting ugly. Second Thessalonians 2 tells us, it says, when He, and I believe it's talking about the Holy Spirit here, He says, when He, the restrainer, is taken out of the way, when the church, I believe, is raptured, then full-blown unrestrained evil will be unleashed on this world as well as the wrath and judgment of God Almighty. The absence of the church's influence will unleash the full-blown wrath of the Antichrist, and evil men. Yet at the same time, it will allow God to pour out His judgment on the earth as this earth has never seen judgment poured out. And the funny thing is, it's not funny, but the weird thing is that as God pours out His wrath on an unrepentant humanity, it says they keep blaspheming the God of heaven. It repeats that phrase over and over in the book of Revelation. Every time God sends a judgment, it says they blaspheme the God of heaven. They didn't turn to Him. They blasphemed Him. But you know, when there's salt and light, the light of the seven year period will be Israel. And if you read Revelation chapter 7 correctly, you realize that there are are probably billions of people that will come to Christ during that time, but they will immediately give their life. Church is not mentioned in the book of Revelation after chapter 3. And the next time it's mentioned is in heaven in Revelation chapter 19. So, zero residual influence, but Israel will finally get the job done. They will do what God has called them to do from the when the, from the beginning of when they were founded to be a light to the nations. be a powerful testimony. But when the church is pulled out, when the restraining ministry of the Holy Spirit is pulled out of this world, the world goes into utter evil and darkness. Keep that in mind. We serve an incredible purpose just by our influence in this world as the church. 
But until then, you and I are salt. We influence, we restrain by our godly lives, we redeem by the power of the Holy Spirit and the Gospel those who are perishing in this wicked, evil world. We are salt. Without us, this world would be plunged into utter darkness. And notice, secondly, we're the light of the world. This is how the darkness is dispelled. In verse 14, he says, you are the light of the world. Again, that's an emphatic statement. It's not saying you can be the light of the world, you might be the light of the world, you should be the light of the world. He's saying you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. That's who you are. And then he says, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Hmm. Profound spiritual principle there, isn't it? If you're light, be light. Shine it. Don't try and hide it. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under the basket. Or under the lampstand, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the room. Now that would be weird, wouldn't it? You know, you're in a dark room and somebody's got a lamp. So they plug it in, they turn it on, and they immediately put it under the table with a big cloth over it. Why would they do that? You know? I mean, why, why do we do that with our relationship with Christ oftentimes? Why do we try to hide what we are? It does, the lamp's still lit. It's just covered. Salt's still salt. It's just commingled with everything else that you don't want to eat. Why would we do that? And notice again, this is who we are. We're salt. We're light in the Lord. That's who He made us to be. You know, I love 2 Corinthians 5, 17-21. He says, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. And if, you know what the old creation is? It's dead in your trespasses and sins. Your lights, you have no light. You're dead. Spiritually dead. But as a new creation in Christ, the old things have passed away. The old deadness, the darkness, the sin has passed away. New things have come. Salt and light. And then he says that God has made us what? He says He's given us the ministry of reconciliation because He's given us the word of reconciliation. That's this. And it also says He's given us ambassadorship to represent heaven here on earth. That's awesome. And if you know the kingdom of God, what is it? It's a kingdom of what? Light. We will dwell, it says, in unapproachable light. God dwells in unapproachable light. You know, I love... Colossians 1, 13 and 14, where he says God rescued us. And it's kind of a almost like a special ops term where God went in and rescued us out of this world and he transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. I love Peter. You know, Peter just tells us, he says, He says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation a people for God's own possession, he says, that you may proclaim His marvelous grace and light. It's an amazing verse. 1 Peter 2.9 Proclaim the excellencies of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. You and I are not just light, we're marvelous light. You ever think of yourself as marvelous? It's a good way to think about it. But it's not your light. It's His light, but it's marvelous. It's awesome. It's incomprehensible. You know, He's the Son of God. We're simply the moons. You know, the moon has no light of its own, although if you've noticed the last couple nights, I have when I walk the dog, the whole place is lit up. I don't even turn on the porch light at night. You know, just save electricity, but just enjoy the moon that, that's out there because it's reflecting the sun. And, you know, that's us. We're like John the Baptist in John chapter 1, verse 8. We are not the light. 
We have no light of our own, but we testify, it says, about the light. And who is the light? The Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who is the light. And as we follow Him, we no longer walk in the darkness of this world, but, but we have the light of life. You know, what a poignant message to the Jews whom God called out of Ur of the Chaldees through Abraham, and His special purpose for calling them out was to be a light for God to the nations, right? And rarely did they do that, but occasionally they did, and God blessed them immeasurably. And You know, what a message to us to whom God has called us to be the light to this darkened, sin-cursed world. Ambassadors of light, representatives of the One who is the light, We shed the light of the Gospel on this dark, sinful world. Through our lives. Through our proclamation. Through our salty influence. And through our presentation of the One who is the light. You know, it's like we got this high-powered flashlight that's on. And sometimes it's just stuffed in our back pocket. But it's on. Because you are the light of the world. What we need to do is start getting it in our hand and shining it on where the darkness needs to be dispelled. Because the command, I love this, of verse 16, is thirdly, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You know, in essence, he says, we are salt, we are light, live like it. Be who you are. We need to live to the glory of God, don't we? And glory, by definition, is light. Marvelous light. Incredible light. But there's a problem with that, isn't there? Because although I am salt, and I will always be salt, I will die being salt because Christ saved me, I didn't save myself, but if you know anything about salt, you know salt doesn't lose the properties of salt. It just becomes so diluted and so compromised with outside influence that it loses its distinctiveness. It loses its salty influence. It becomes polluted and useless. So too with a Christian, we can become so influenced and so polluted with the compromises of this world that we lose our distinctive flavor. We lose our influence and we're no longer preserving influence in this world. In fact, up we, we, we end up adding to the pollution. We end up adding to the problem. We make it difficult for others who are really living like salt and light to really shine. Because we kind of shroud everything they do with our darkness. And we lose our platform for why people should listen to what we have to say. Our distinctive flavor is commingled with the world, and, and that's why we don't give ground in, or we don't cave in, we don't compromise, even in the face of persecution. That's why. Because if your light doesn't shine, if your salt doesn't influence those around you, what chance do they have? We've got the cure, they've got the disease. How selfish is it that we wouldn't share it with them? You know. Now, it's the same with light. Though salt is more the living of the godly life, light is the proclamation of the godly light. You don't take the light of your life and the light of Christ and put it under the peck measure or under the bushel or under the basket like whatever version you're reading says. A light once lit is meant to be a city on a hill. They can be seen in the darkness miles away. It's like a guidepost. Somebody can look at your life and go, wow, that's what a Christian should be like. That's what a Christian should live like. That's what a Christian should be saying. And they hear it. And they see it. You're a city set on a hill. You put your lampstand for all to see, or your light on the lampstand for all to see, for all to benefit from, for all to hear. You know, salt preserves, light proclaims. Salt influences, light enlightens. Salt stings, light light saves. Salt flavors, light illuminates. But it takes both to be effective, doesn't it? You've got to live the life and you've got to proclaim the message. You've got to be salt and light. Not just one or the other. 
I'll never forget sometimes when I was a young Christian, man, I'd be living a bad lifestyle and I'd be sharing Christ with somebody I'd be out with or something. And I remember twice, a person looking at me and going, Bob, you're always talking about Jesus, but you're just like I am. It's like, <laughs> you know, it's like the Holy Spirit took a sledgehammer and went, bam! What are you doing, fool? You know, we've got to have the life and the words, and they got to match. Salt and light. they got to match. You can't be living a, a worldly lifestyle and proclaiming Jesus, or, you know, and we can't be proclaiming Jesus. Uh, anyway, uh, you, you got it figured out. It sounded good when I first thought of it, but anyway, we've got to be salt and light. So, beloved, what will it be? You are the salt of the earth. That's what he says. It's an emphatic statement. He doesn't say you become, doesn't say you could be. He says you are the salt of the earth. But as your life become tasteless, bland, literally trampled underfoot by the temptation and compromise of this world, is your life polluted with this world? Think about it. Or is your life spicy? Salty, flavorful, watchful, sober, and vigilant for that which would pollute your influence and for the opportunities. You know, in, in DTS, we say, you know, we look for opportunity. We pray about opportunity. We look for, for springboards. We look for spiritual conversations. Is, is that your life? Or you try to avoid those things? You know, we need to be spicy. We need to be, you know, salsa Christians. That's a term. I hope that wasn't offensive to anybody. But you know, we need to be spicy, right? We need to we need to let we need to have influence for Christ in this world, and that needs to be our main concern. And how's your light? Is it set on a hill? Is it on the lampstand for all to see, for all to benefit from? Or have you become very sophisticated at hiding your light and making excuses for why it's under the table? The remedy, verse 16, let your light so shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works. That's the salty part. And glorify your Father in heaven. That's the ultimate part of living to the glory of God, isn't it? You know, Paul caught on to this when he said in 1 Corinthians 10.31, I mean, he just wrapped this up beautifully. He says, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do what? All to the glory of God. You think, the way I eat? You kidding me? The way I drink? Are you kidding me? Whatever you know, I do. Do it to the glory of God. Yeah, that's what he said. Your whole life is to be lived to the glory of God. If whatever you're doing doesn't glorify God, don't do it. Stop it. Do what glorifies God. Then men will see that we are salt, and they will see that we're light, and they will see our good works and they will glorify our Father who is in heaven. That's the ultimate influence you and I can have in this world. That others would come to Christ and glorify God because of how we live and the good news that we bring to them. Because in Christ, we're already salt. We're already light. So let's live like it. It's pretty simple. You know, let's live like it. Let's live unpolluted lives. Let's live uncompromised lives. Let's be salty. Let's shine brightly for Christ. Let the message out. You know, when a guy comes to you and goes, Oh, you know, man, my wife's leaving me and, and gosh, they're, they're going to fire me at work and I, I just don't even know where to turn. You don't go, Well, go down to the welfare office and check out the federal government. Share the Gospel. <laughs> Say, brother, you need someone bigger than yourself to solve your problems. And it's not the federal government. It's Jesus Christ. You know, so often, every day, we have these kind of opportunities. And what if we were to let our light shine? What if we would let that influence, that saltiness, come out? What kind of impact could... 200 people 
have in this community if that were the case? What kind of influence could we have in our world if that were the case? If we took the bait and ran with it. You know, because people, people are scared today. They're dealing with just brutal things in their lives. Marriages, you know, with kids. Just all kinds. Of, there are so many opportunities to bring salt and light into people's lives. It's, it, it's, it's amazing. And I just, I just want to exhort each one of us to take that opportunity and be salt. Well, we are salt. But be salty, flavorful, unpolluted, and be light. Let the light of Christ shine off of you through the Gospel. Bring people the good news. Because I tell you, this world's increasingly becoming a bad news place, isn't it? Let's pray.